It's very bright. Uh, okay, I think we'll get started now if everyone's ready. It's about seven o'clock, I think. So, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Teaching House Presents here at um, OHC in London. Um, I have the unusual pleasure of both saying hello to everyone and uh, presenting at uh, this Teaching House Presents. As you know, we always have uh, two presentations here, so uh, I will be the warm-up, if you, if you like, for uh, John Hughes, who will be coming on uh, a bit later. Obviously, he's going to be talking about uh, materials writing, and I've had a sneak preview at his slides, and I'm quite interested to see exactly what he's going to do with them. Uh, and also, I'm quite interested because some of the things I think he's going to talk about will uh, definitely involve some of the things I would like to talk to you uh, about today. So um, I'll just go straight into my presentation, I think, on uh, diversity in the EFL or ESL classroom. Um, so <clears throat> I wanted to start really by thinking about um, our learners and the sorts of things that we think about when our learners come into our rooms and we want to help them, obviously, so these kind of needs and wants. And often we think about things like how old they are, where they're from, their experience of learning English, why they're learning English, etc. Also, in terms of where we are here, like OHC here in London, and I guess quite a few of you are London-based teachers, although we've got a few people here that are on the, uh, the trail ends of Ayatefel, which I'll be mentioning a bit later. Um, but we also think about the length of stay, how long they're going to be here in the target language uh, place. But I guess some of us think about it and some of us not, but maybe we need to think a bit more about kind of... Um, their religion, their gender, their abilities, their sexuality, because these things do make a difference to what we do in the classroom, I believe. And hopefully you'll agree with me. And if you don't now, maybe by the end you will. Okay? Um, so I think we can all agree that part of our role, and we have many roles to play, would be to encourage learners to speak about themselves. Personalization is something that we talk about a lot when we're, teach when we're teaching or when we're doing teacher training helping solidify language, whether it be vocabulary or uh, chunks of language. Personalizing it helps people remember, helps our students. Um, I think another thing, especially here again, as London or UK-based teachers, it's helping our learners understand what they're seeing, hearing, and experiencing around them, which might be very different to what they're used to in their native countries or where they've grown up. Um, and also, I think it's important that we create this safe learning environment. So everyone should feel comfortable in the classroom. Uh, they should feel comfortable to be themselves, to talk about themselves, but also to express their ideas, their queries, and to, to express um, when they don't understand something, whether it be language or kind of culture related. And we do get culture teaching as part of what we do, I guess. I'm not gonna go too much into that though. Um, Katie, one of our teachers, I think uh, maybe a year and a half ago, maybe two years, she did a presentation here about diversity uh, from a, and she was talking about some of the things I talked about in a previous talk. So Katie and I talk a lot about this. So it's really good we're now working together. Um, and she pointed out um, about our, our prevent duties. And these are some of the things that we are expected to do. So promote social and cultural diversity, equality, opportunity and inclusion, uh, sorry, of opportunity and inclusion. That's part of our role. Um, to plan and deliver effective learning programs for diverse groups in a safe and inclusive environment. So all our key words. And also to encourage students to respect other people, okay, with regard to protected characteristics. And they could be a, a huge variety of things, okay. When we think about the 2010 Equality Act, there's a whole list of things that are protected and it's part of our duty to follow that as educators. Um, it's also part of inspection criteria. So just to take English UK inspection criteria, T16, courses will include strategies which ensure students can develop their language skills outside the classroom and benefit linguistically from their stay in the UK. They're going to see lots of language around them and some of this language is going to be related to diversity. And if we don't talk about it in the classroom, it's very hard for them to assimilate this to understand what's happening outside the classroom especially when they're in a target language environment like London. So, here are some of the unavoidable issues, the kind of things that we see. I ask my students to look at newspapers all the time, whether they're low level or high level. Just try and pick out the words you know, look at the pretty pictures, whatever, right? Encouraging them to see more language. Front page news of wonderful uh, 
material you can see, like the star and the sun. But you've got things that, you know, words like uh, gay uh, come up quite a lot. Being PC, whatever that may mean, okay, the, the idea of it doesn't exist in some countries. The idea of it appalls some people in this country, as you can see from here. So it's something they might come across. Um, recent news, I was talking to friends and colleagues about this. Uh, this shouldn't be breaking news, but apparently, stop the press, first black family on Coronation Street. It's exciting stuff, right? Groundbreaking. Um, and also, I think some of us will be aware of the, the events that happened with this particular actor. I don't want to go into too much of it, but that brought race right to the front page. Lots of people were talking about it. Okay, So these are things they see out and about. Um, it's also in terms of films. In London, as you're walking around, you'll see lots of adverts for films, whether they're on buses, on the underground, and you have the opportunity to see these films as well. You may even ask a student, you know, what films have you watched lately? Why not write a review of a film? And they may choose films that include LGBT themes. Like, I couldn't resist putting this one in, being as I'm Simon, of course. Um, Oscar-winning films like The Favourite have large sections that are to, to do with um, fluidity of sexuality, for example. Uh, TV shows include, in this country, characters that are wheelchair users or people with disabilities, people with uh, different religions and races and the way they dress. So it's unavoidable if they're coming to this country, students will find a mixture of cultures. And sometimes that can be shocking. And sometimes they need to be able to talk about it in the classroom to understand what's going on. Um, again, in terms of disability, this isn't something you'll see in every single city or in every single country. Disabled access toilets and what they mean, or indeed disabled access um, areas, buses, the fact that you know, we give up our seats or give up spaces for wheelchair users is something that might not be familiar with everybody, depending on their nationality. I've lived in certain other countries where, having lived in one country in particular for eight years, I saw two wheelchair users in the whole time I was there. Um, so, you know, it's a lot more regular here. How do you talk about these people? How do you mention them? Which words are correct to describe people that are wheelchair users? Okay. Again, we're in London. I hope you can, you can see this. This is uh, Tottenham Court Road, the station just down the road from us. Uh, you'll know, I expect, that in February there's um, LGBT History Month. Um, and of course we have a huge Pride celebration here. We're in Soho. You know, it goes all the way through here and it ends up not far from here at Trafalgar Square. And if you walk just down the road, you will see LGBT rainbow flags everywhere. So trying to understand what all that means uh, is, or helping our students understand what this means could be part of our role. Again, being Trafalgar Square, I don't know if people have noticed this, but if you go to Trafalgar Square, the lights were changed several years ago. That's where Pride finishes. So the, uh, what are they called? Pelican crossings, right? They now include symbols that represent uh, transgender or straight couples, gay couples, lesbian couples. It's all there, okay? So again, someone might see it and think, what is that? What does it mean? Why is it here? And they could bring it back to us as the experts of London. Right? The kind of questions I get about London wouldn't surprise me if these are included, right? Best fish and chips? I don't know, right? Um, and of course, you can't avoid certain things, right? So uh, the very meaning of this word, when is it offensive? When is it not offensive? Who uses it? What do they mean when they use it? Can I use it? Okay, these are things that, you know, students, astute ones, might ask themselves, but they need to be able to ask you the teacher, and they need to feel comfortable to be able to do this, okay? And of course, we are in London. The mayor of London is not a white Christian, right? For once, for now, right? So again, it's this idea of tolerant, tolerance? Tolerance, equality, um, the fact that London is a very multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-sexual city, and it's very, very visible. Something we might not uh, that we probably take for granted, most of us, because we're here every day. But for our students, it can be shocking, it can be unusual, it can be something they want to bring up and something they want to talk about. I just want you to consider for a moment, maybe in just small groups, small groups. Um, I'm going to show you a few exercises that 
I regularly do with all kinds of students of different ages and different levels. I just want you to chat with your partners for a minute and consider this. Number one, are these the sorts of things that you might do in your own classes? And number two, which of these have the potential to bring up issues of diversity, whether it be race, gender, sexuality, religion, etc.? Okay, so just a couple of, well, one minute, two minutes to consider these things. Okay, just get talking. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to interrupt. There's a lot to talk about here, but I want to get through a few things and then get some more discussion going here. So, um, I don't know about you, but just eavesdropping on your conversations there, I mean, these are things that I do regularly in my class. Same for you, these kind of things, right? And in every single one of these situations, race, diversity, sexuality, gender, it all comes up, you know? Tell us a bit about yourself. I have to decide, as a gay person, am I going to come out and talk about my boyfriend and my husband, or am I going to create my girlfriend and my wife because that's how I feel comfortable in this class? Am I allowed to talk about my sexuality and gender in this class? Am I allowed to do it in my home country? Am I allowed to do it here? Depends on where you're from, right? Okay. Um, again, family members and friends. Okay. Who are you showing here? This is my uncle and his partner. Right? Okay. Ooh, what does that all mean, right? For some people, it's like, what do you mean partner? Okay, we'll come to that later. What did you do this weekend? Okay, it could... It, Anything can come up there, obviously, absolutely everything. I went to mosque, I went to the synagogue, I did this, I did that. So again, things coming up, unusual words that not everyone will be familiar with. And again, as I think I mentioned um, before, have you seen any good films lately? Okay, maybe they saw The Favourite, maybe they saw Love, Simon, maybe they saw whatever, okay, or series. There's very rarely now a series on Netflix that doesn't have some sort of, uh, let's say, non-vanilla straight, white character, right? They're, they're more diverse now, thank goodness. Okay, reflecting more of society. So, um, I think I agree with Moore here, who wrote a few years ago, that um, classrooms should include space for students to speak honestly as themselves, okay? So this is important for, as I mentioned before, this kind of increasing proficiency. The more I can talk about myself, the more I can use the language that you're teaching me in the class, or the language that I want to use in the classroom, okay? Um, I'm really happy this year, by the way, super happy. I've been talking about diversity, uh, and in particular LGBT plus things for a few years now, and this year, uh, great news, John Gray did uh, a plenary at Ayatefel, which was on this topic. So there are certain people that have been working on this for many, many, many years, and the number of people interested has got bigger and bigger. I used to start all my presentations by saying, not much has been written about this, not much has been spoken about this. I can't do that anymore, and I'm really pleased. More could be written, and more needs to be done, but you can see a lot more out there, which is accessible to us, teachers and researchers, not just academics, so it's fantastic. So this is something that John Gray said, and you can watch the whole thing, it's online. Um, making these changes, making sure we include diversity, and making it visible in our classrooms will not be easy, and we can expect some resistance. Resistance from some students, resistance from some colleagues, resistance from some institutions that are worried about these things. And, as someone was just asking here, and I think it might connect with what John's talking about a little bit later, resistance from some publishers and what is and is not permissible in published materials. So I think some of us are familiar with parsnip. This is a term that's come up. This is the acronym that stands for those things supposedly that we're not allowed to put in or the editors edit out, okay? Can anyone remember any of the words from parsnip? Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. Good. 
Okay? <laughs> That's my favorite, isms, yeah? And pork, yeah? So here it is. Politics, alcohol, religion, sex, narcotics, isms, and pork. Okay? These are the things that we won't find in mainstream textbooks because textbooks need to be sold to the biggest audience possible. And if you don't include these things, the theory is that you'll sell more. Okay? Um, but I think we need to attack this. We need to, we need to do things and we need to create some of our own materials and adapt materials. Um, I want to show you a, a few uh, examples here of what I'm going to call a parsnip snip, things that have been taken out of text or that are missing from texts. Okay? So again, uh, John Gray, a few years ago now, said that LGBT invisibility and heteronormativity are very much the order of the day. Okay? There are very, very few gay, lesbian or transgender characters in the books or stories relating to them. And anyone famous that could be associated with those things, like, uh, I don't know, Oscar Wilde, if there are things, that part is not mentioned in the text. It's not seen as that important or it's a, a sexuality thing. It's snipped. So let's take a, a classic family tree that we teach. Now, when I teach family trees and when I've been taught family trees, I find it very frustrating. With all of the words here, I could not describe my real family because my parents have been married several times to different people. I have half-siblings, I have step-siblings, and they're not there. So the diversity of my not very unusual family, well, maybe I should take that back. <laughs> they're quite unusual, unique family. So my, my family situation, it's not unusual in this country, right, is not represented here, okay? Also in terms of diversity, I'm just looking at these characters and uh, everyone's white, everyone's white kind of frustrates me. They're just, where are the multiracial couples? Where are the multiracial families? You're very often, I've, I've just been teaching a beginner from uh, Cutting Edge, and they've got great stuff. I quite like this book in that it's vari there is variety in who we're talking about. So the family here is kind of Spanish, I think, or Spanish-speaking at least, but they're all Spanish-speaking. They all have to be Mexican, or they all have to be Indian, or they all have to be one race. They can't be mixed which is kind of not reflective of, of society. It kind of frustrates me. Um, again, this is, this is something I've shown a few times, and I took it from ben, Ben's book, um, Framework. Okay? Uh, he did a really great presentation, one of the many people that have done these kind of presentations. And he talked about this particular exercise here, um, which is just a, a gap fill exercise. It's just past simple gap fill, but it's couples talking about how they met each other. Of course, you've got two Germans, two white Germans that meet each other, and the other couple are also the same race. But what do you notice here? <gasps> A same gender couple. Shocking, right? There's Simon and Ricardo and how they met. Okay. Um, so this book's from 2003. So although um, Scott Thornbury, he has to be mentioned in every single presentation about EF EFL, right? So years ago, say 99, I think, he said that, um, I can't remember the exact quote, but almost that, there's nothing more invisible than LGBT stuff in ELT. It's not quite true anymore. There are things out there. But let me just show you something. See if you can spot the difference. This is framework. The next slide is going to be new framework. Just see if you can spot the difference. Simon, which is a fine name, by the way, <laughs> has been turned into Simone or Simone. Exactly the same text. It's Ricardo and Simone. Exactly the same champagne glasses. But the new framework, which was several years later, the LGBT has been washed out because of parsnip. When the difference between framework and new framework is they wanted it to go into a bigger audience. And so they whitewashed it. Okay, so it's a classic parsnip snip, something that's missing. Um, are you familiar with this book? Yeah, me too. <sighs> I'm not a great fan of it. One or two lessons, maybe, and I certainly used them when I started teaching. But just have a look at some of the things in here, tackling issues of diversity. Just think about how they would go down in your class.
This is a classic example of what we can call othering. It's not including or integrating diversity, it's othering it. It's saying, hmm, transsexuals, they're different. What kind of question is that? Would you sit next to one? Like, what kind of question is that? What kind of discussion are we going to get from our students? Maybe one of them is transsexual. Not everyone is you know, outwardly transsexual, right? So how awkward would that be for that person? How disgusting of us to ask that kind of question if they're in the class. The same with, uh, you know, how do you feel about other people coming from, uh, people coming from other countries to live in yours? What a great topic, yes? Do you like immigrants or not? Yes or no? Come on, quick. You know, I know we're in an atmosphere of Brexit here, but this is not the kind of conversation I want in my classroom, okay? Now, I understand, um, I understand the, the idea of it, and I'll show you a slide about that in a minute, but this othering is something I can't stand. And this is another example of it. I, in fact, did this lesson today, and it comes from uh, Clockwise. So it's a little article on house husband, uh, a house husband, and the idea... Mm, sorry, Mackie. Mm. I just noticed in the previous slide, for gay families, what is a normal family? The word normal. Exactly. And to go back to that family tree right there, that's not a normal family for me. Okay, I don't know about you. So yeah, what is a normal family? Maybe we could talk about that without having to say gay, right? Are gay strange or are they normal? Are they other? Are they like me? Are they not? You know, look at it, point at it, poke, poke it with a stick, see what happens. <laughs> really divisive. Really divisive. Hmm. Excuse me, can we only look at these issues from, the, uh, from our point of view here from Great Britain or also uh, taking uh, point of view from other countries? I want to come back to that slightly towards the end, but that's a really valid point and, ex and an excellent point. Okay, so make sure I don't forget to come back to that. Thank you. Um, so here's another example here of, of a house husband, and the questions that, of the reading text are these. What do you think of Mike's job? Because, of course, a house husband is not a job, right? Okay, and uh, could you be like Mike? Would you marry someone like him? Like, we don't know anything about his personality. We don't know this man. You're basically saying, do you agree with house husbands or not? Right? Again, it's othering in action. It's not, let's talk about this, let's integrate an idea. Um, so I, I took this um, text today, and the questions I asked for the reading were, who do you think works harder, Mike or Tina? Because Tina is mentioned here. It was a really interesting discussion about who works harder. And it was really 50-50 split. And it didn't matter about the gender in my class, but it was a split between who works harder, because he never gets away from work. But then she has two jobs because when she comes back, she also has to do housework, right? It was a much more interesting integrating experience and we got a lot of emergent language from it. Um, and then more, more like this, okay, could you do what Mike does? So it's not saying, is being a house husband a good thing? It's saying, could you be a house husband slash housewife? That's it. Okay, so it's not othering, it's more integrating. Now, I understand the point of things like taboos and issues, as I said, and I think in this, this text, Tekin's not saying that um, this is something that it should be agreed with, but yes, discussion, discussing controversial issues will help student use skill in negotiating, agreeing, disagreeing, explaining opinion, justifying, etc. I would argue that these two questions also lead to arguments justifying opinions, but it's not confrontational. It's not saying, is it right or is it wrong? It's just saying, is it for me or is it not for me? So it's slightly different, right? Um, now, Cynthia Nelson, who wrote uh, a really important text on sexuality in, uh, in the English language classroom, which is an excellent book, um, says that it is important not to set up tasks that ask students to evaluate or judge lesbian or gay people you know, whether they're moral, whether they're normal, whether they're like us. We shouldn't do that. And I would expand that and say we also shouldn't do it about race, disability, religion or anything, in fact. Right? We can include these things in our classrooms without making them uh, black and white, without making them do you agree or not agree, if you see what I mean. So here are a few things that I would propose, including that idea that I just showed you. Um, Using inclusive models. So this is when we're making our own materials or choosing the materials. And I know there are restrictions, 
at OHC, we have guidebooks uh, and guidelines, bless you, of things that we, um, that we follow. We have set texts, but we are encouraged to supplement those things, right? So this is what I'm talking about. Um, I'm sorry, it's quite dark here. I hope you can see it. So this is just a very bad picture of one of my uh, boards, so excuse the board work. Um, this is just looking at language, okay? And I boarded up some sentences and asked my students, do these sentences mean the same or different and what? So I've got here, he's been living with his husband for five years. He's lived with his husband for five years. He lived with his husband for five years. Discuss together what the difference is between them, right? So the point here is not to discuss sexuality, it's to discuss the grammar, but I've just used an inclusive model because why not, okay? Now here's a reaction of one of the students. Not a reaction to me, a reaction to the partner. Yeah. And the reaction of the partner was... <laughs> Maria needs to work on her S's, obviously, but I don't have to step in. This is someone from China and someone from Spain having a conversation about diversity. And after she said that, um, Flora said, oh, okay, and they got back to the task. So it wasn't this butting against, it was just an inclusive model and we concentrated on the language. Um, other examples, inclusive models, could be the things that we put around the school. Some schools I've worked at have had uh, symbols or signs up especially around pride to do with tolerance. Um, so these are things we can put around the school as students around, in the cafe, in the library, so that students are aware that we're living in a tolerant society and a multicultural, a multi-ethnic, multi-sexual, multi-ability kind of society. So it's including it, not just in the lesson, but in the school atmosphere. And in fact, here at OHC, when students join us, like in most schools, they have a welcome session and we tell them about the school and all the other things. And one of the slides, the things we include, is about expecting respect. That any student in the school should expect to be respected and we ask them to respect each other and to respect the teacher. Okay, and if they feel that that's not happening, we tell them what they should do in those cases, who they can talk to. So we try to build that up from the very first day. Um, now Anton from Russia found this quite difficult. Right? But again, without me stepping in, luckily, another student stepped in to uh, give Anton a bit of uh, encouragement. <laughs> now what I find interesting about that is, do you notice the, uh, the phrasal verb there, or the, the, the pattern there? She learnt that from this poster, <laughs> right? Great, I was like, yes, fantastic. Well done, Vanessa. Um, okay, but there are other students as well, and this is coming a, a bit to what you said, but there'll be more of it. So um, Adrian from um, Uruguay, when he came in, it was a very small class, he's speaking with the other students. Um, he identified as a, a gay man, and he was very, very open from day one to talk about it. All his, I was gonna say all of his experiences, but no, I meant all of his life, you know, his partners, his breakups, he, was, he wanted to talk about everything. And um, in a private discussion with me, he said that by the end of his two weeks, with this other student, a Saudi student, he said, I became her teacher in and out of the classroom. I showed her Soho. <laughs> what she made of Soho, we're not sure, but he took her on a tour around. He took her to a bar in Soho. This is a Saudi woman that didn't know much about it, was wearing you know, a headscarf, but they became very good friends and they're still in contact through WhatsApp in their respective countries. So, you know, because the environment was inclusive, he felt comfortable to be able to talk to her and the teacher encouraged it as well. I think that's a win, 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 win situation. Now, I think it's not just about the ideas, but integrating diverse characters in what we're doing as well. And again, it might be something to do with materials writing. So we saw that sometimes these are snipped out, but we can just put them back in because we don't, we're not stuck using the textbooks. We can add various things. So, um, uh, if we take Duolingo as an example, not the best way to learn a language, and I'm really struggling with my Spanish, but I got one right, that's good. Um, but you can see they use a variety of characters from different ethnicities, possible different sexualities, not sure, right? Um, but they also have speaking bears, ducks, and dolphins. So, you know, they've really integrated everything there. 
we don't have to go down that speaking dolphin um, route, but we can integrate more characters. So, um, for example, uh, again, the BBC, a beginner level course, which I was encouraging my student to use, there's a, uh, because this is an ESOL more than EFL, so people that are moving here to live here, the characters are diverse and they do tend to get together in diverse groups, okay, which is great in terms of accents and backgrounds. Um, now, for me, um, why did I bring this one? Right, integrating diverse characters, right. So this is something that I, again, did recently. I've done it many times, but I did it recently to see if it still works. So um, with a pre-intermediate group, um, I gave out random pictures. In fact, they chose them at random, okay? And what I wanted them to do was to take a picture, and this picture became somebody they knew. So it's a classic kind of introduce your friend. They had to talk about where they were from, their name, their hobbies, where they first met them, their family, etc., etc. Okay? And I threw out a variety of pictures in terms of different ages, different abilities, different ethnicities. They didn't get to choose. There you go. They went away for homework. They came back and they presented in a big mingling they presented friends to each other and then decided who would make good friends or who would get on with each other. So um, to give you an example of this one, um, Aaron Wheels Fotherington, it's quite, there's some amazing videos of him on YouTube, by the way. So this was, um, uh, it was given to two students at random. Uh, and one of them, Elif from Turkey, came up with this. Okay. Elif's never really had to talk about someone using a wheelchair before, and certainly not in English. So again, some really interesting language came up here. I just let it go, and after the discussion, we talked about, well, what do we do in a wheelchair? Do you ride a wheelchair? Is that a good collocation? Mm, probably not. He likes riding in his wheelchair. Well, we came up with other stuff. So someone else came up with this. This was uh, Marcia. Now, she's doing two things which I found really interesting. She's tried to figure out what exactly this guy does in his wheelchair, but she was also peer teaching the word wheelchair. Word wheelchair. She was going around and saying, he likes skating in his wheelchair. This is a wheelchair. Okay, so she's learning how to use the word. And then we talked with both groups. We talked about the best way to discuss what he does. And I think we came up with, he, he likes doing stunts in his wheelchair. Okay, or he just likes doing stunts. We don't need to say in his wheelchair because he does everything in his wheelchair. Okay, so again, it's integrating those characters. Now, another, um, another student, this was Manuela. She had this guy, and this is what she came up with. Okay, in this one. I am someone who, in all of my classes, uh, I try to be inclusive in the language I'm using. So when I give examples about anyone in the class or about myself, I tend to say boyfriend or girlfriend together you know so I say oh so this is Dave imagine Dave has a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a husband or a wife so I try to make it open let's let's talk about this they're all available and Manuela seems to have picked up on this and she's decided okay I can have a gay character great no shock in the class everyone took it like okay fine yeah great and um, I think in fact Dave and I can't remember what the wheelchair the wheelchair user's name was but I can't remember, I know his real name is Aaron, but I can't remember what they created. But they said they'd be very good friends because they could drink beer together. Diversity in action, right, in this. Um, another way of integrating diverse characters at a very, very low level. Um, I have a, a low con-pron class, and we were talking about different types of home, where we live, furniture, etc. Okay, very, quite basic stuff, but I tried to push them. So we looked at different types of homes. I did not use this picture, but I couldn't find a good enough or a better picture for my PowerPoint. I apologize. I used a better one on my sheet. Um, and afterwards, once we drilled those words, I gave them a set of people. I gave them these people, and I asked them this question. Which home would be best for these people? And I gave them a variety. And I put next to them what these people represented. So this represented a young family a wheelchair user, a rich per person, and uh, I can't remember if it was a senior citizen, something like that, okay? Variety of characters, okay? And with that, some really nice discussion at kind of elementary level came up. You know, they were saying, obviously, uh, a lighthouse would be difficult for a wheelchair user because too many steps, 
Okay, so they're using this language. They're considering other people from different diverse places. It's not just where would you like to live, but these other people. What would work for them? What wouldn't work for them? So that's what I mean by integrating these topics and diversity into everything we're teaching and everything we're doing. I also think it's worth exploring ambiguity. Uh, my previous presentation here was all about ambiguity. Um, again, I told you, I often say boyfriend, girlfriend, and I also use this word a lot. Anna picked up on it. Why are you always saying partner? What does it mean? Obviously, she comes from uh, Spain, and in Spanish, a word they might use has a gender associated with it, right? Novio, novia. So it's quite clear if I'm talking about my girlfriend or boyfriend. English is great because you can just talk about your friend or your partner and nobody knows, right? And it's also very natural, okay? That is how I talk about my partner. I'm not a big fan of using the word boyfriend or girlfriend because I've been together with my partner for years and it, I just don't like that word. It doesn't feel the right word for me. So we talked about it, this word partner. And again, I'm sorry that the slide doesn't show up here, but we were talking about the difference between friend, girlfriend, and boyfriend, and the ambiguity, where it exists and where it doesn't. So if someone said, I met up with my friend, it's totally ambigu uh, ambiguous. Is it a man or a woman? Don't know. Uh, she met up, uh, she met her girlfriend. Okay, ambiguous? <coughs> Could be, yeah, especially in American English, right? Where girlfriend is just what friends call each other, right? He met his girlfriend? Ambiguous? Not as ambiguous, right? Probably they're together in this case. And then he met his boyfriend? Ambiguous? I would say no, right? Because generally men don't call each other boyfriends unless they're partners. Okay, so again it's exploring this kind of language. What difference these words can make. And again, because of this, I'm a big fan of using um, diaries and getting my students to write diaries. This is a diary that was written by an Italian, um, and she started using the word partner a lot. It's just a word she decided to use. So it's including a word that she's not going to find in a book that says boyfriend, girlfriend, mum, dad, granddad, grandmother, you know? Like it's a more diverse word. Uh, and to go back to this word, can't help it, right? This word is incredibly ambiguous, depending on how we're using it. What does it mean in this particular picture? Let's not go down that route and talk about it, right? I can think of many things it could mean, right? They're going to hear this word, students living in this environment. They're going to see, hear it if they're watching videos. Or videos? What year is this? If they're watching films, if they're watching Netflix, of course, that's what I mean. If they're watching Netflix. Um, I think one more thing I just want to point out is this idea of overcorrection as well. Vittoria from Italy says this. There are several errors here, but it's hard for me to say where the errors are. Now, obviously, I can't to do it. That's an easy error. But what's the other error? Does this person have a boyfriend? And therefore, this is incorrect. Does this person have a girlfriend? And therefore, this is correct. Like, I need more information. If I overcorrect and say he, Maybe I've corrected someone that wants to say girlfriend but has missed, missed that opportunity, right? So it's a time to pause and say, sorry, is it girlfriend or boyfriend? Okay, good. Or partner, if you want to be more ambiguous. Okay. So to sum up, just a few things for now, okay? I think uh, it's important for us to notice the gap, right? The gap between what might happen if we're only using textbooks and the gap in the knowledge of some of the people that are coming from different countries. And again, I have focus at the moment on people coming here to places like London, diverse places, where we are expected as educators, as I showed at the beginning of the, um, the presentation, we are expected to follow and to, to, to show diversity. And it's part of the Equalities Act, right? So it's noticing the gap of what our students might not know or how, how to talk about things, right? Using words that could be offensive in some places, right? And I think it's also acknowledging the importance of filling that gap, not just thinking, mm, he doesn't know how to say wheelchair user, never mind, right? But actually going for it and making it a learning point for all of the students at once. I think it's about challenging parsnip, right? About uh, adapting materials, including things that should be there for our learners, especially here in a target language environment that encourages um, 
and uh, uh, fosters ambi uh, not ambiguity, <laughs> tolerance, right? So we ourselves as educators can use inclusive models that can be integrating language, integrating characters, integrating ideas uh, and, and set phrases, exploring the ambiguity of words like gay, girlfriend, boyfriend, partner, um, and avoiding those overcorrections. Okay. I'm, I'm going to leave it there because I think I'm about right time-wise, but this is a good time just for any, any questions or comments that anyone might have. Did you want to bring up your point again? Yeah, the question was, um, are we looking at it from a UK-London point of view, um, or are we looking at it also from other points of view? Um, what about diversity, and how much can we, should we say, are we allowed to say to include? Because if you have students from countries mm. uh, where they they get a death penalty because they are gay or lesbian. Um, and these people might go back and usually go back. You can be arrested, you can be deported for spreading propaganda in some countries. In terms of doing it here, I'm not advocating that we have a gay lesson. In fact, I'm advocating we don't have a gay lesson or a disabled lesson because that is only going to lead to othering. It's going to make some people uncomfortable. Some people have nothing to say. They have no experience. Other people that, that might feel that they are, let's say that they, um, they feel that they, they, they might be gay or lesbian or trans, let's say, right? In their own country, they are unable to talk about this. But suddenly, they have an opportunity to do it here. That can be a wonderful thing, right, for them to be able to do it. But I'm not saying they have to. I'm saying if we have the integration that we've opened the space, it's safe. If you want to talk about it, you can, because you can be yourself in my classroom. If you don't want to talk about it, I never force students to talk about their own lives if they don't want to. If you want to describe your family tree, go for it. If you want to describe your family tree, go for it. I used to, my family tree is a nightmare, right? So I just used to say in French classes, I'm an only child because it was quicker, right? So my, I'm, I totally agree with you. We shouldn't force it, okay? And it's gonna make some people uncomfortable. Right at the beginning, I said that. We're gonna face resistance, not only from people that don't agree with homosexuality, but sometimes from people that are. There are some very interesting studies where whether they be teachers or students, they don't want to talk about it in class. They're not comfortable about it. I'm not saying they have to. I'm saying let's create a space that they can if they want to. I think I hope that answers some of the question. Mm -hmm. mm. What would you do if uh, we had a group, um, a class, and there were, uh, let's say, five boys and making comments, quite misogynistic, uh, from the same country, mm -hmm. and, you know, making inappropriate jokes, and perhaps two girls as well, mm. uh, who can understand and something a bit uncomfortable. How would you address this situation? I think that's a good question, and it's a question we all have to ask ourselves. Mm -hmm. But we have to put it into lots of perspectives. Mm -hmm. How would you feel if you heard racism in your class? Mm -hmm. If you heard um, anti-Semitism in your class? At what point are you going to step in and say something? Mm -hmm. Are you going to announce it to the class and say, that is unacceptable? Mm -hmm. Are you going to take these people aside and say, listen, what you were saying earlier is not really in this country, it's, it, it's going to get you into trouble, you know, saying things like using that word. You might think it's funny in this country. It's not going to get you in funny places. So I think it's a case by case basis. And I think we've all had experiences where we might have had to say to a student, you can't really say that word. You can't say that. You know, it's embarrassing for us. It's uncomfortable for us to have to have those conversations. But I think it's a learning point as well. In some countries, there are certain cognates. That's the word you use to describe someone. You know, um, thinking about Russian, uh, where I lived for, for some time, the word, the translation of like disabled person or wheelchair user, they would say invalid. I don't think that's a great word in English, right? But it sounds almost the same in Russian. So it's a false friend. Do I attack them for saying it? Or do I just say, look, the better word to say is that. Right? So I think, yeah, it can be uncomfortable. Or like with the gypsy, for example, in Spain, they are quite proud to be gypsies. It's their culture. 
Great. Exactly, yeah. So you have to say, like, I mean, and you can't say, if someone wants to identify as a gypsy, or they want to identify as black, or uh, I want to be disabled, that's what I am, then okay, that's fine. That's oh. fine, yeah, yeah. Sam, I just want to share something. Um, I have a cousin that's no longer with us, unfortunately, but he left um, the UK in the early 80s. And um, back when I was a child at school, there was a I mean, from what I remember, there was a, a time where we were told at school, and I specifically remember being told this, that to refer to black people as coloured. So when my cousin John left the country, um, I, he left the country thinking that when we're talking about black people, we need to refer to them as being coloured. And he taught his children, because he was an English teacher abroad, to say, oh, you know, in order to respect black people, you need to say colored person. So when I went to visit him a few years ago, it just came up in the conversation. And I was, ah, <laughs> and I said, and it's something that happened in this country, imagine. And I said, John, you know, you, your son just said this. And he said, yes. And I said, no, 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 we don't say that. We don't say that. That's not acceptable anymore. Mm. But he didn't know, because he'd been out of the country. And he said, but, that's, but when I left the country, that was acceptable. So even within, as a native speaker within the country, things change. Definitely. Um, and so it's, I think it's definitely worth bringing up in class. And yeah, I think to keep on top of these things, what does it mean? Which words are offensive, which are not? Who are they offensive to and how can they be used? I think these are things, again, that we do with, with any piece of, of language. Where is it, like, appropriacy? When can you use it? When should you not use it? If you're going to use that word, it's going to get you in this kind of company and this kind of trouble, right? You sure you want to go down that route? We can't, we can't change people. You know, if someone is racist and they come to London for a week, we're not going to change their lives, probably, unfortunately. They'll go back to their own countries and they'll continue having their thoughts. But since they've been in London and they've seen multiculturalism working in action, or they've seen, uh, you know, different sexualities being open in this country, that's how we are here. This is what we do. I'm not saying it should be in their country, and they can have their own thoughts on these things. But if they're going to use English, they need to know what these things mean to English-speaking people around the world. I think I'll leave it there now, because I think uh, there's still wine and nibbles to have uh, at the end. But if anyone wants to have any more conversation, I can talk about this all night long, but I won't, because John's got to talk here. So uh, thank you very much. If anyone's interested in the slides or any of these, uh, there's loads of references and more things. Um, I can send them on to you. Just send me, whoops, send me uh, an email, best at my private email there, and um, I'll get them to you. All right.